Oops. All right, we're good to go. Mr. Marshall, I think we're uh, we're ready when you are. Although I uh, certainly don't see some of our members. On the on the meeting, unfortunately. Well, it's the way it goes. Maybe they might be joining us shortly. One never knows. But uh, we can go ahead and get get started. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming to the board, Wildwood uh, Board of Public Safety meeting for Wednesday, July 15th, another virtual meeting. Um, as we still try and navigate our way uh, through COVID. So uh, with that, um, Michelle, want to call the roll? Um, I sure do. So Marshall Scott Collier. Here. James Mundell. Here. Um, Lynette Baker. Here. Um, it looks like Dave Bertolino is currently absent. Um, Denny Welker. Looks like he's signing in. Okay. I'll call his name again if I see him pop up there. And then Jeff Baker. Here. And John Bradley. Here. All right. Um, okay. Do we have Denny yet? Uh Okay. Thank you. And it looks like we have Sam and Rick today. Okay, now I got it. It took me a second to kind of get everything going here. Right. No problem. Okay. I know it's kind of like that that uh, kid show. What was it? Romper room. I see Rick and I see John. So. <laughs> Next up, approval of the minutes. Has everyone had a chance to review the minutes? And does anyone wish to offer any corrections to same? I had no corrections or additions, so. Hearing, hearing no objection, I, I will assume uh, we accept the minutes. Anyone object? To accepting the minutes as written. Hearing none, the minutes are adopted. Um, Michelle or Sam, do we see anybody in the queue from the public? No, sir. We do not have anybody in attendance this evening. All right. Well, if someone shows up, we'll give them a chance. Um, so moving on to the fourth item on the agenda, we have a uh, uh, the annual crash analysis report. Uh, Rick or Jim, I wasn't sure uh, which of you wished to speak to that. Um, Mr. Marshall, I was gonna defer to uh, Captain Mundell if, uh, if that's okay with the captain. Uh, police generally, well, they do put the report together annually as required and uh, typically presented to the Board of Public Safety for your consideration, your questions and comments. Um, so if that's okay, Captain, I'll turn it over to you. Well, if there's no objection, I'll just read the report, uh, all uh, 45 pages to you. <laughs> no. <laughs> no uh, first off, I apologize for it still being in draft form. There was one uh, item in there that this is uh, put together by our research and analysis office in the police department so that our our stats are, are valid and they're kind of the smart kids that uh, can do the diagrams and the tables and put that all together. There was one error that we couldn't change that they had to change and that got sidetracked due to everybody being working from home. So uh, it, it, we actually just got it today. So I, I do have a final version of it that will uh, push out and allow the uh, city to, to put on uh, their website. Um, a lot of it is very consistent with what, what was there last year. Um, the, the actual 
number of accidents have decreased slightly. So that's a good thing. Um, you know, our deer crashes obviously are still still of concern, which is something we'll we'll talk about more this evening. Um, you know, jumping into recommendations, you know, we'll continue our enforcement efforts. Uh, we try to focus our enforcement efforts on on the crash locations, particularly where there's there's uh, speed issues and injury accidents. Um, that's you know really really uh, you know where we're going to focus our efforts. There there is uh, you know speed equipment that we kind of put on the back burner for this year. Um, that we may revisit before the end of the year. Uh, really just speed feedback signs, signage, uh, you know, radar equipment, things like that, that aren't a necessity, but, you know, it, it makes a good effort on our part when, uh, when we get those speed complaints that we put something out there, we do some monitoring, we can give Rick some data that we, we have a speed problem at a location or we don't have a speed problem at a location. Um, and, and a lot of times it, it's a speed complaint, but there's no crashes, you know, to, to say that we really have a terrible problem there. Um, you know, some presence, some enforcement, uh, you know, is, is usually pretty helpful to, uh, to curb it. We can't solve speeding. We can't make it stop, which uh, that's pretty much the complaint that uh, we get and that Rick gets that you know, subdivisions want, want their speeding put to an end. What's the, the one final thing that's gonna make it stop forever. And it just, it just doesn't exist. So uh, if there's any particular questions, you know, let me know, like I said, there's, there's a lot in there, you know, pinpointing and, and uh, we know that our, our five main uh, heavily traveled roads, that's where we're gonna have most of our accidents due to the just the uh, traffic volumes of travel on those roads. Uh, and that's generally the places we try to be, you know, to uh, deter speeding or deter, you know, other hazardous moving violations, you know, things to that effect. So I don't know what else you were looking for, Rick. I don't have a PowerPoint or anything like that, if, if that's what you're looking for, but. No, it looks good. Looks pretty comprehensive. I did note um, or took note of the uh, crash density uh, figure one. I'm presuming that um, that is, you know, at 109 and what is it, Old Etherton? On the far north end? At the far north end, yeah. Yeah, that's that's yeah. right around uh, like south of BA. It's kind mm -hmm. of hard to see on a small map here, but. Uh, south of the that north juncture of BA uh, down to where that that uh, Etherton cutoff is mm -hmm. right at the moment that that's kind of closed although people keep exiting there and are surprised when they drive past the signs and right the bridge is gone so uh, but yeah and, and I think that's that's in a uh, a plan down the road uh, Rick may be able to comment on that as far as you know developing other roundabouts and or you know I, I know we talked briefly about relocating or repositioning that intersection that's just an odd intersection that you kind of come down and around and it's a, a little bit of a blind intersection that it just uh, cuts off to the right there if you're going northbound and when you're coming out you pretty much need to make your decision that you're going to go because the uh, the site distance is isn't the greatest you know just due to the terrain there uh and you know again that was you know hopefully something something down the line to uh, reconstruct that that intersection in some way all right thank you very much any other questions or Captain Mandel. Yeah, just just, uh, just a little bit more, uh, Marshall. The the three areas that that pop up red there, 
the one you just mentioned, uh, the other one's at Clayton Road. It's, it's mm -hmm. basically in front of the high school at Clayton and 109. Um, I don't know if that has anything to do with it. There's electric signal there, obviously. You know, if, uh, if the students are running into each other, I know that on their parking lot, they, uh, there are quite a few of minor fender benders of, of backing into each other type of thing as far as a particular address where there's a lot of accident. Mm -hmm. And then the other place is the, uh, the area around West Glen Farms, which is pretty much the, the first big filter, you know, coming into the city, so. Right, okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you, sir. So moving on to old business. Uh, first up, we have review of the deer management plan proposal. Rick. Um, thank you, Mr. Marshall. I appreciate that. Um, uh, board members, I'm sure you're aware uh, previously or earlier in the year, um, the uh, deer management subcommittee prepared a survey um, that was available to Wildwood residents regarding the deer population and associated problems uh, with the deer in Wildwood. That was done uh, last winter time. The results were provided to you, I believe, um, I wanna say at February or March. Um, since that survey was wrapped up and presented to the board, the subcommittee has been working um, since that time to actually prepare a draft of the actual deer management plan. And that has been pulled together and presented to you um, tonight uh, under this agenda item. Um, I don't know if people had an opportunity to take the time to read the draft plan at this point or not. It is of some length, but not too lengthy. Um, the plan itself is intended to be um, guidance for the city for the next uh, 10 years to guide our efforts and strategies for deer management within the city of Wildwood. Um, so the plan contains specific goals and objectives uh, to manage uh, deer throughout the city. And I think the one thing that I wanna mention is it doesn't contain a lot of specific information. It's intended to be very comprehensive, but yet not so specific as to be completely detailed. And it doesn't contain a prioritized list of objectives or goals um, or any schedule associated with it at this time. Those details would be forthcoming, um, likely additional work from the, from my perspective, that would be additional work that would come out of the subcommittee uh, and be pre presented ultimately to the Board of Public Safety at a latter date. Uh, the intent with this document is more of a comprehensive plan again, to guide our activities with the city that we can all agree on. And then if the board adopts this plan, the thought of the director of public works would be that the plan then goes next to the city council um, for their review and approval um, at the city council level. So Mr. Marshall, I would be glad to go through this in detail, or if you would like to speak to it as well as you've been very actively involved in the preparation of it. Um, kind of your preference. No, go ahead. You're on a roll. Go ahead. Well, I will, I will continue then. Um, so the, the plan defines two primary goals um, for deer management in the city of Wildwood. The first goal is to proactively manage the deer population of Wildwood. Sounds like a pretty basic goal for a plan such as this. And then the second one um, is to educate, communicate, and engage with the public regarding this plan. So that's really, that's the gist of the, the management plan. And I, I would say that another point, a lot of these things are things we're already doing um, and are in there just to document that we want to continue doing them. And then a lot of these things are, are things we are not doing yet. So they would require additional actions um, on the part of the city. So if we go through the two goals and objectives, again, goal number one, proactively manage the deer population in Wildwood. Um, that goal has 
I guess, objectives A through D as part of it. Um, and objective A of the first goal is to annually assess and monitor the deer population in the city, which again is one of the things that we are, we have done. Uh, we have done one deer survey um, not too long ago, but this would essentially include this in the plan to make that an annual assessment to monitor the deer population um, so that we have a, a ongoing basis to know what the population is at and where it's headed, if it's going upwards or downwards. Within, within, that, strat within that objective, there's a couple strategies. Um, the one was to include uh, annual budget appropriations so that we could, that we could undertake these, these surveys. Um, so if the Wildwood Precinct is going to be engaged and responsible for completing these surveys, that we be sure that we budget enough funds so that, that they can do that activity every year annually. Um, and secondly, the Wildwood would, Precinct would work with the Missouri Department of Conservation to complete the surveys of the deer during the appropriate time of year and report the results. So um, we're still trying to refine, I think, the cost of doing that survey um, based on some of the prior work by the Wildwood Precinct, I came up with a cost of roughly $1,000 per square mile. And I think if we, we may wanna look at that a little more carefully to be comfortable that that is an accurate number. Um, so I think there may be some questions relative to uh, the scope of the deer surveys that we wanna complete annually and the cost associated with those deer surveys. Uh, Cause previously we only surveyed a five and a half square mile area of the city. And of course, the overall footprint of Wildwood is much greater than that. So moving forward, if there's no questions um, with that objective B under the first goal, simply establish a deer population goal for the city of Wildwood. Um, we would do that by working with Missouri Department of Conservation uh, to develop an appropriate long-term goal for the deer population in the city of Wildwood. And I would expect that the um, Aaron Shank would be instrumental in helping us come up with that, that number of, of what that figure is we're going to shoot to obtain for the deer population and how much, assuming we want to decrease that, the population, you know, what that number might be. Uh, moving on, if there's no comments about that, Objective C, produce the deer population with Wildwood, and that's Kind of an obvious thing to state, but that that is one of the main um, tenets of this plan. Do we want to go forth with the intent to reduce the deer population, or we could just say that we want to keep it the same? Um, but right now, we have it listed that we want to reduce the deer population within Wildwood. Um, so to to obtain that objective, we've listed. Um, is three strategies um, for consideration. Um, the first strategy would be to consider city ordinance modifications which support deer management efforts within the city of Wildwood. Um, first and foremost, we've talked about a no feed ordinance. Um, seems to be something that would be fairly easy to pull together and recommend to city council uh, for consideration. Um, there's other potential ordinance changes that have been um, mentioned as a possibility and have been included in this document, um, such as um, combining properties or allowing properties to be combined to meet the three acre limit for archery hunting, um, subject of course to HOA approval. Um, and there could be additional ordinance changes that would promote um, safe archery hunting within the city of Wildwood above and beyond our, our existing hunting regulations, such as um, requiring the marking of arrows by bow hunters, um, such as providing advance notice to neighboring property owners uh, of their of permission that's been granted and intent to hunt on adjacent property. And finally, just providing advance notice to the Wildwood Precinct uh, of permission and intent to hunt on private property. So those are the kind of the ideas regarding ordinance changes that, that could be possible. Any questions about that? If not, I'll move forward on strategy two. 
support and encourage expanded opportunities for archery hunting, hunting on private property within Wildwood. Um, since we want to be, we want to encourage those activities um, as much as we can on private property uh, so that hunters can take advantage of that within the city of Wildwood. Um, so the, the one sub, sub strategy would be to develop a program to match licensed hunters with interested private property owners within the city. Um, that's an idea that's been suggested by some hunters and some property owners, frankly. We do get calls on that occasionally um, of hunters wanting to know where can I go to hunt. So um, that is one, one possibility. Um, if, if we were to go that, go that direction, the Wildwood Precinct could check that those hunters are licensed as, as are required. Um, and we could identify uh, key land owners, which might include HOA uh, subdivisions where they have ample common ground that might be interested in participating in that program. So actively recruit property owners um, to, to be part of that program. So if there's no questions, I'll move on to strategy three. Strategy three is support managed deer hunts within the city of Wildwood. Um, so under this one, I think we've talked a little bit about St. Louis County and Greensfelder Park, which is a large park within the city of Wildwood. Um, you know, we could recommend and request to St. Louis County that a managed hunt be held on Greensfelder County Park. We know that they will allow it now, um, but we would have to make that specific request of the county for it to be granted. Um, but it is, it is possible that they would allow that if it was requested. So that's a simple, a simple ask potentially um, by the city. Um, second bullet point, support and promote managed hunts on other public lands. We know that we're already doing managed hunts through the Department of Conservation on, in Rockwoods Reservation, as well as Babbler. So just being able to promote those hunts and um, promote awareness of those within the city of Wildwood so that hunters know about them and take advantage of them if they're so inclined. Um, finally, on this strategy, we could develop and recommend a managed hunt or hunts on city or private properties working with Missouri Department of Conservation. So this might be, uh, I think these next three bullet points uh, probably would have the potential to gain a lot of, uh, of interest and probably rightfully so. Um, so the thought was potentially working with MDC to um, develop a managed hunt on private property or city owned property or possibly a sharp shooting program um, within the city of Wildwood whereby presumably the police would be involved in the sharp shooting program, um, but certainly we could investigate a private company like White Buffalo doing that as well. Um, again, none of these are intended to be hard recommendations um, and necessarily detailed recommendations, but um, more general um, strategies that we could undertake. So any, any questions on, on that aspect so far? I don't have a question. I would just, I would just add that, you know, particularly with strategy three, but with in, with all of them, this is not a do them all sort of suggestion. Um, you know, some of this could, we could get to, you know, strategy three and maybe we just wanna do, start with Greensfeld or County Park or something like that. Again, this is a long-term plan. So we don't have to, you know, commit and the council doesn't have to commit to do everything that's recommended here. But I think if you look at it overall, um, these, these are things we could look at and sort of decide going forward to phase them in. If we aren't getting enough impact and we go to the next next level. That's correct. It's it's somewhat a cookbook that we can follow to uh, potentially implement and hopefully reduce the deer population. So the last, the objective D uh, in that same um, within the plan is uh, reduce the deer vehicle incidents on roadways within Wildwood. So uh, you just had a report from the Wildwood Precinct, their annual crash analysis included in there is their tracking of deer vehicle incidents um, that they do on an annual basis. This is just merely um, including that effort within this deer management plan. As I said, many of these things we're already doing, it's just recognizing that fact. Um, so we, we would propose to continue that effort um, 
and then build on it um, based on the data that we obtain. Um, if we determine there are specific areas that warrant consideration um, for either additional traffic control measures um, or things we can do to improve safety, reduce those incidents, we would certainly consider that. Uh, as well, strategy two, consider the implementation of new technologies, which may be able to reduce the number and severity of deer strikes in the future. So just recognizing that that is a significant um, concern for many residents is the risk with deer vehicle incidents in Wildwood and, and hoping to track that and look for uh, ways to address it in the future. Any comments on the objective D? I went through that pretty quickly. Did I skip a page? <laughs> I feel like I skipped a page. <laughs> Scott? Yeah. If I may, Rick, um, this sounds like a really old, stupid question. Maybe Captain Mundell can, can respond quickly, but in, back in the olden days, uh, people used to put deer whistles on their bumpers of their cars. Do you recall those and were they at all effective in alerting deer that approaching car was approaching? I don't know how effective they are. Uh... <laughs> We, I, I kind of took on that project when I worked in uh, the West County Precinct and found a company. They're very small. They're, they're about the size of a quarter uh, that you, you stick on the, like in the grill. We, we actually put them on all of our police cars on the light bars, you know, on the underside of the light bar. And we didn't really do a, a good job of tracking <laughs> whether or not they uh, reduced our police car accidents involving deer and we have maybe a half a dozen of those you know a year that that they run into the side of the police cars or they they run out in front of the police cars so we we're, we're part of those statistics um that the price that depended on how much you uh you ordered they were you know a couple bucks a piece three four dollars a piece for i think i had the department buy like 400 of them um and we put them on pretty much all the cars in West County, uh, you know, Fenton and Wildwood, West County, uh, just to see if it had an impact. And it kind of got lost in the shuffle. Uh, the, the insurance guy in our risk management office that was tracking it uh, retired. So <laughs> the numbers kind of went out the door with him. Uh, but, you know, we were obviously seeing that we were having an over number, an, an unusual number of, of police car accidents involving those deer, you know, with deer. So we're trying something for, you know, a couple hundred bucks. If that saved us one, one police car from uh, getting wrecked by a deer, that they just paid for itself. So uh, were you thinking, you know, like the, the city would have a supply of them and, and offer them to residents or, uh, like I said, they're not a tremendously expensive. I wasn't, didn't really have any particular plan, just looking at this uh, strategy and saying that uh, new technologies, which may enable us to reduce the severity of strikes, um, that just popped in my head as I, I know that people used to do it, but I didn't know of any empirical data that said that they actually work. And um, if you had that data, then that would be good. And yes, maybe that's something we should look at. If the data doesn't exist, then uh, let's not waste our money on them. The problem is, it's like law enforcement. You don't know what you're preventing. <laughs> There's no feedback. I, I still got a, a dozen or so more left. This is the one, I don't know if you're gonna read it or not. It's called Save a Deer. And they got a website. Of course, they, they claim that their product is, is the best and very effective. So you have to buy their stuff. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I saw that book last week. There, there's really not much to it. It's, uh, you know, it's just a little item that, you know, we just stick on, like I said, we, all the wild police cars have it on them. So uh, I'm hoping we're preventing something, although we have had one or two uh, deer, but they're, they'll do damage, obviously, but uh, it doesn't seem like we've had as many. We can certainly double check the to see if there's any research out there. I've not kept up with the if there is any science in those in the in the deer whistles. I know they're very popular. We can yeah. certainly check though. And there's there's all different kinds of, of products out there. You can 
pretty much go to any you know hardware store or sporting goods store and find them. It, it's really what you're willing to pay to you know to have some peace of um, peace of mind. So I know that our our previous police chief uh, was driving home one night and hit a deer, and I reviewed the report and talked to him afterwards and I said, hey, do you, do you have a deer whistle on your, this was his own vehicle and not his police car. And he, he said, no, I, I don't believe in those. I said, I got this, you know, the wonder, the wonder whistle. I said, I'll, I'll put it on your, on your cars and on your police cars. And it, it says for it to, to be effective, you have to be at a certain speed. So he's like, well, that means I have to, you know, travel at 35 miles an hour and basically can, can drive without without worry, you know, I, I, I didn't go that far, you know, so do you believe it or not? I, I think it, uh, you know, you can see the deer react to it. You know, if they're standing roadside, they do look, but are they looking because there's a car coming with headlights on or are they looking because they hear noise? I, the deer never comment. So anyway, that's an idea. Should I continue on? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, the second goal, I think I'm on the second goal now. Uh, if there's no further questions on the first goal. And as I said before, the second goal is educate, communicate, and engage with the public regarding this plan. So it was kind of recognizing that there's two sides to it. We need to make sure we're communicating with the public, with residents about what we're wanting to do and make sure we're getting feedback from them about it. Um, so we, we want to provide information to the public about all aspects of deer management in the city of Wildwood and create opportunities for additional public engagement um, with the implementation of this plan. So objective A, educate residents on the deer management plan. So basically tell them what it is and what's in it is objective A. Um, and some of the strategies with that um, develop promotional flyers or materials to educate residents on the plan and how best to live with deer. Strategy to complete an annual social media campaign to promote the deer management plan. Um, we did some work earlier, I think, um, on this, this issue, but it could certainly be something we do every, every fall, say. Strategy three, promote the deer management plan through our, through our wild through our Wildwood website, as well as a newsletter and other sources. And then strategy for promote and educate residents on the use of the deer damage prevention techniques, such as fencing repellents, scare tactics, those sorts of things. And that's something that Missouri Department of Conservation recommends as well. It's just promoting uh, ways that people can, can live with deer uh, in their yard, in their pro on their property. Um, objective B, ensure resident engagement in deer management plan decisions to clearly communicate outcomes. So um, first strategy as necessary, engage various residents through surveys, public meetings, open houses, and other appropriate public input venues to ensure resident interests are considered. So there's a lot there that could potentially be done. And that's probably a really important aspect of this that we shouldn't forget. Um, so there could be a lot of uh, room for some comment, I think, on that one. Um, so that's really it for the second goal. Um, are there any questions or comments about the second goal? If not, I think... Um, I'm, I'm, uh, we'll defer to the marshal on this, but I think the goal uh, with the presentation of this document again is to have the Board of Public Safety, Safety formally approve it at some point, whether you choose to do that tonight or you want to postpone the decision to the next uh, meeting of the board. Um, it's kind of up to you all as a, as a, as a group. Um, if you feel comfortable Approving it tonight, we could certainly move it forward to the city council at the next city council meeting, if that's your desire. Again, I'm certainly available for any questions from any of the board members. Any thoughts on that to that effect? I'll say, Rick, I, I don't have an answer from our boss yet if they want the 
the police to do the sharpshooting or not. Uh, I have, I have put that forward. So, um, that, but that shouldn't, you know, hold everything up. That's just kind of one, one small part of the plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is. It's an important part of it, I would say, but, um, be a good thing to know before we probably take it to the city council if possible. But yeah. Understood. It's an important decision. Hey, Rick, um, or Marshall, I, I haven't, to be honest, I haven't had a chance to review it. So I, if we push it off, it'd be fine with me because I really haven't gotten into, had the opportunity to read it in any detail. Okay, Dave. Yeah, um, I don't know who all worked on this, but I really want to thank them. Uh, Scott, uh, I know when, uh, um, who was it that previously was heading it up? Um, Anyway, he had to leave us. I don't know who picked up the ball, but I really appreciate your efforts on this. This is a good document. Um, my comment uh, as liaison from the council is uh, we have a very new council uh, in terms of the, you know, a huge turnover in the number of, of new um, representatives on the council. Uh, this is going to be all new to them. They don't have any history per se, on the actions and things that we've done before in discussing deer management. Um, I would be a little hesitant to put it before the whole board at this time, or the whole council, uh, simply because I think there's still, it needs some needs vetting by, by representatives. What I would suggest, uh, Scott and Rick, is that maybe we take it to admin and public works. Again, that committee is about half and half old and new members and kind of vet the process through them and get feedback from those eight people. And I'm on that committee as well. Um, before taking it to the, to the full council, um, because th as we all know, uh, once you present something like this to 16 people, you get 16 opinions uh, and <laughs> it's very difficult to, to, to reach consensus. So the more we vet it up the line before we present it to the council as a whole, I think the better prepared we'll be to, to have a, um, a, a firm and final vote on it once it gets to the council. Rick, is there any kind of timeline Idea. that you wanna have this kind of in place? Or, well, I, I think I'd defer to the board, frankly. I, I, I want to say I, I would agree with Mr. Bertolino. That's probably not a bad approach. But I mean, you could say it would be nice to have this in place by the fall because some of the things we might be able to move on mm -hmm. in advance of uh, hunting season, that might that kind of thing. Right. Um, and I think there are certainly some folks that are, are looking forward to having something presented and move it forward. Um, so there's probably a, a desire not to to waste too much time, but, um, um, but I do like Mr. Berlin's comment about potentially taking it to the Evan Plot Works Committee first, because um, there is a lot to think about with this document. If I may, Rick, um, the the document has a lot of, um, I don't want to say pressure, but a lot of influence by the HOAs. Um, it looks like the the, the the pivot point here on most of these decisions about hunting, not hunting, and so on, we say fall back to the approval of an HOA. Uh, and as we all know, that's that's a tough nut. Um, you know, any given day, we can't even name all the HOA members, uh, our directors, and so on, because they change very often. With the COVID situation, I doubt if any of these HOAs are meeting at this time um, and able to take this proposal to their residents and gets any kind of resolution. So I would think the timing of getting it out um, would be extremely lengthy at this point, given that uh, I really would think we would want to communicate with those HOA directors and trustees uh, before we launch something. Um, and that is a little problematic right now, I think. Thanks. Yeah. 
Please, Lynette. Yeah, so I, I will say that uh, you did a great job uh, with your uh, goal of um, coming up with a comprehensive plan. Um, it does look like you've included, uh, uh, you know, everything I could, um, you know, think of. Um, so with the question of the timeline and then the uh, suggestion to go to the admin and public works and then also talk with the HOAs, uh, I mean, what, what would that look like if you went to uh, the admin and public works? Would that be an August meeting? Is that what that would look like or? Their, their next meeting would be the first week of August. So that'd be the next opportunity that it could be done, yeah. And then I, depending on that outcome, you would possibly uh, be ready to go to the council in September or? I'm just trying to um, understand steps forward. Well, yeah, if, 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 um, if it went to Edmond Public Works at their meeting the first week of August, there would be two subsequent uh, city council meetings in August where it, it could be presented um, to the city council. So it, it could conceivably get through council in August. Okay. And, and then once again, this is a, a comprehensive plan. It doesn't include the, the uh, detail of the actual implementation that I heard earlier in the in the meeting that the subcommittee would continue to do that work. Is that correct? Well, I, I don't want to speak for the subcommittee. However, mm -hmm. I, I would expect that they would continue to meet, assuming the plan was approved, and then they would drill down into the details and uh, using any feedback that we might get from the public or maybe further engage the public, but try to prioritize the plan and then choose what what strategies they want, they want to move forward with and then bring those strategies to the Board of Public Safety first. And then if the board is agreeable, hopefully they would advance you know, ultimately to city council. So I don't right. see a lot of these strategies moving forward without the council's action, most likely. There, there may be a few that are that are fairly, or maybe we're already doing them and it's just building on them. But for the most part, I'm thinking most of the consequential strategies are definitely gonna to go to the council for action. Okay. Yeah, I was just trying to um, see if uh, it could be, the moving this forward could align with the, the hunting season as mentioned earlier. Uh, and then it also seems like since it is the comprehensive plan, I heard uh, the, uh, Marshall earlier uh, saying that, you know, we, we wouldn't do everything. Uh, you know, we could do some things um, versus others, right? So with that in mind, it sounds like uh, we could possibly implement parts of this um, sooner rather than later and then continue to work on, on the rest of it if it worked, if the council approved. That's that's the way I, I would envision it, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would agree. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I know sometimes with a comprehensive plan like this, when we put the implementation uh, plan in place, then it could take, you know, another three or six months. So uh, it's just uh, looking at the calendar and trying to understand what that might look like from a timing perspective. But thank you. Sure. Any other thoughts or comments? Um, in an effort to sort of get you know some feedback and whatnot, particularly while you know we're still digesting this, um, and, and Denny in particular, would you would anyone object to moving this forward to administration and public works for their review and commentary while we continue to to look at it here? So that way we can get some comment back um, sooner rather than later. Uh, make any necessary adjustments we may need or want to make. Dave, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think it's probably a good idea at least to get it into their into their hands to start looking at it, thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And if there's any fine tuning. Yeah, we could, I would adjust. agree, I agree, Cabinet, that um, I, I'd say two things, uh, Scott. One is, um, we can certainly like tomorrow or even tonight, I can call uh, Joe Gartano, who's the chair of the admin and say, 
we'd like to have this on the agenda for August. And Rick, I'm sure that would not be a problem and he would get it on there. Um, I, I would envision this, um, I think the most helpful approach might be, Scott, if, if the subcommittee or all of us on this committee uh, join that um, Zoom call uh, on the next admin public works and sort of presented this, um, and I hate to put extra work on the committee, but presented it in a, in a uh, more concise, maybe one page, uh, here are the key points that we want to discuss with you kind of approach and present it to them, not just give it to them, let them read it and then start talking about it because that, that will take all night. Uh, so I'd, I'd rather kind of focus our attention on the key issues and uh, that can be best done, best served like either by uh, Marshall Collier or, uh, or uh, Rick or somebody on the subcommittee could do that. Yeah, and I, I'd be happy to uh, take that on, take that action. Are you looking for a motion, Scott? Um, well, we can be formal about it. We can say, I think I think you pretty much have made a motion uh, to move this on to public works and administration. Do I hear a second? And then we can discuss. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Any concerns with that? I think it's actually a pretty good idea. Okay, hearing no objection. All those in favor of moving this forward? Uh, to the administration of public works, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, moving it on. Thank you. Let me know when that uh, meeting is or whatnot, and I'll be happy. Absolutely. To yeah, we'll plan on you uh, participating and being there. Yeah. Let, let me just say again, Scott, I, I really, really appreciate all the effort that went into putting this document together. Bye. Uh, you know, we've been kicking this can down the road for many, many years, and this is the most definitive thing that we've uh, seen produced. So thank you again. Well, most of the work was done prior to my even becoming involved and it was entirely a group effort, uh, you know, by everybody and, uh, you know, kudos to uh, Rick and Michelle for really rolling this ball forward. No problem. That's what we're here for. All right. Um, Update on the acquisition of the LiveScan fingerprint workstation. Captain Mandel. Or Captain, or is Sam available to, take, to speak to that one? And I can't believe you guys are still rolling ink prints. <laughs> um, this was relative to the uh, status of the, uh, the LiveScan fingerprint acquisition process. And I gather there was some updates we wanted to provide on that. <laughs> Is that... <laughs> I apologize, I st stepped away for a second there. Uh, did you need something, Rick? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, we were- um, Talking about I, the I probably didn't didn't... fingerprint. I just volunteered for something. Uh, yeah. The uh, agenda item on the live scan fingerprint workstation uh, was there an update uh, that was going to be provided to the board on the that process? I'll, I'll comment first, Sam. If you want to add something, I don't know if you spoke with someone at Regis. So, so when we uh, started in this endeavor, uh, we were kind of under the understanding that it was a it was a piece of equipment, it came self-sufficient, which they came in, installed it, it has its own computer, and then kind of find out afterwards uh, for it to work, there needs to be a, a, a connection into the uh, Regis system, which is regional justice information system for the uh, metropolitan area. It's the data warehouse where all of our rest information uh, goes from booking and then that's transferred out to the to the highway patrol um and that's that's how arrests are recorded is by by fingerprinting um and because of that uh we were missing a a part uh that regis has to have a separate computer which again we believe that we're already attached to the regis system in our in our station that it's just a matter of plugging into that 
and it, it wasn't. There's a separate computer that acts as the interface uh, for the live scan machine and, and processing the fingerprints and photos from booking that goes into uh, to Regis. So when we found out about that, there is a price tag on it. Uh, there's a, a uh, annual maintenance fee of about $2,000, 2,200, I think, uh, Sam. And the initial uh, equipment that we have to get from them is also about five to $6,000, uh, you know, one-time purchase for that. And then beyond that, it would be a, uh, an annual maintenance, uh, you know, fee. So I turned to Sam and said, Hey, uh, we have an additional expense that we, uh, weren't really aware of, or, or was not considered at, at the time of the original, uh, request and purchase. Um, Fortunately or unfortunately, you're, we're kind of at a point where uh, we're not making a whole lot of rests. Uh, the court is not has not been in session for several months, uh, but there is a, a mandate uh, from the Highway Patrol that a lot of the uh, misdemeanor cases that are that are handled through the municipal court will require people to be fingerprinted. So it's a necessity that we we would have to have the equipment. And and have to go through this this process to uh, to have that connection. So uh, I'm slightly embarrassed. I'll blame our IT guy for not giving me the right information because he's not here to defend himself. Uh, but it is it is several thousand dollars, you know, additional expense that uh, that we did not present. So uh, I humbly ask for that to be uh, considered and approved so that we can move forward with that project. And. The, uh, I turned the contact info over to Sam. I don't know if uh, if you reached out to Regis or got anything additional that you want to add. So no, I mean I, I trade <clears throat> voicemails with uh, with the contacts at Regis, and I, I don't have an issue with the purchase. It's going to be under ten thousand dollars. I could approve that without um, you know really any sort of formal approval from council. But my hesitation was uh, we would plan to use Prop P money. And I think it's just a good practice to to send any potential Prop P expenditures through this board before we go ahead and move forward with making those purchases. So I would concur with Captain Mundell's recommendation to approve the purchase, but I just wanted to give uh, this board the opportunity to, to have the conversation about it. Sure, thank, okay, thank you. Um, in fact, that's what was running through my mind uh, when uh, Jim was talking about it was, you know, to use Prop P, so. What, one other thing yeah, that we have, we have plenty of dollars in reserve for that uh, from that fund as well. So, yeah. One other thing to add was they weren't expecting it all to be paid at once. That you know it could basically the equipment part of it could be paid for this year's uh, budgeting, and you know the other half could be could be next year. So uh, it's not a hit all at once. Totally up to 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 Sam and how that's done. So I mean, I, I would prefer just to get, you know, the full full purchase of the equipment as well as the first year of, uh, of coverage under it, get that done with one purchase order and, and okay. move on and continue with the annual maintenance thereafter. Very good. If I understand you correctly, we, we have the funds available currently to do that. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I hear that and Jim has pushed that out as a, in the form of a motion to approve this request. Um, do I hear a second? Just raise a hand. Anybody? There we go. <laughs> Any discussion? Concerns? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay. Let's, let's step into the computer age. Motion passes. Thank you. Now, you don't have to buy as many Clorox wipes for, you know... Oh, those are provided free to all board members. So, <laughs> everyone, free hand sanitizer for everyone. Awesome. So, all right. Um, moving on to new business Allenton Road traffic concerns. Um, thank you, Mr. Marshall. I can start off on this one if that's okay. And I think I may. Certainly allow Captain to speak on this one as well um, as it affects 
Public Works and the Wildwood Precinct, uh, both departments. Um, Public Works has had a uh, contact from a gentleman by the name of Sean Conaway, who resides along Allenton Road. Um, Allenton Road, I would assume most of you have traveled. It is, it is of course, a city maintained. It's considered one of our arterial roadways. Um, it's about 3.6 miles in length, 20 foot in width. Um, runs basically due north south provides a connection between Route 100 on the north and I-44 on the south. So it, it uh, to get there, you actually have to go on Melrose from Route 100, and then you have to come up through Eureka from I-44, but it, it does provide a, a route between 100 and 44. So Mr. Conaway has um, been very vocal with his concerns, primarily about speeding traffic and, and also truck traffic on Allenton Road. Um, and he would, he certainly has made a formal ask that there be consideration to restricting the road from truck traffic or through trucks. And it has, as I said, has, has been vocal in, in, in uh, providing his frustration to the Wildwood Precinct as well as the department regarding speeding traffic. Um, as part of this uh, memorandum that I provided you, I, I did give you an indication of the traffic on the road I think that's just good practice to provide that where we have it. We've been trying to provide a, or develop an inventory of traffic counts throughout the city um, over the last uh, four or five years. So um, I did provide that information to you. We did a recent count um, last month. It's um, only as good as, as the data that we obtained. Obviously it was summertime with COVID-19. I expected the count to be lower and it was significantly lower. The 2017 count was 970 cars as an average weekday traffic. It dropped to 750 in 2020. And the truck percentages went from 3.9 in 2017 down to 1.2, but I would have expected as much given that we did the second count in the summertime. Um, um, so as I said, we uh, the, the Wildwood Precinct has, has been working hard to provide enhanced enforcement the speed limit right now is 30 miles an hour. Um, the alignment of the road makes the enforcement challenging and Captain Mundell can speak to that, I'm sure. It's a very curvilinear road. There's no shoulders on the road. So there's not a safe place uh, and many times for the officers to pull off and pull somebody over um, when, they're, when they're doing the enforcement. Um, I did try to provide through um, Captain Mundell to the board uh, a summary of the Wildwood Precinct's enforcement activities, as well as their speed surveys and the crash history. And that was in your memorandum on the second page. Um, if you'd like, we can certainly go through that um, in more detail, um, but it does give you an idea of the level of effort that the Wildwood Precinct has put into this, this area, this, this roadway. Um, and it does give you an indication of the, the current speeds based on their enforcement activities. Um, Captain Mundell, would you like to speak any further on the Wildwood Precinct's activities um, with regard to enforcement? Yeah, just to add what you were saying, Rick, uh, there's not a whole lot of crashes and actually, you know, looking in that, that summary, our number of crashes have, have actually slowly decreased. It's not a huge number to begin with. There were six back in 2015 and, you know, we're only halfway through this year uh with with two crashes um we are we are present and, and i don't know if this is a, a squeaky wheel type of thing uh you know where the resident happens to be outside and somebody goes by and that that bothers them that they uh you know reach out to the mayor to to us um but we are there we've always been there um we do the best we can um you know Tickets are issued, stops are made. Uh, you know, it, by no means has, has the roadway, you know, been abandoned or we, we do not have a presence there. You know, we certainly do. So, uh, you know, that, that's about it. it it's, a, it's a tough, tough road to work just because the way it's constructed. It's, it's really just two lanes. And, uh, you know, if you, if you stop a car anywhere near a curve and, and the next guy, is speeding or, or just not paying attention and they come around a curve and there's 
you know, a police car stopped in the traffic lane, we're going to get hit. Uh, you know, we put the person that we've stopped in a position of, of being injured also. Um, you know, other than <laughs> starting from scratch, you know, making it a straight road in some way, uh, it, it is what it is. And, and it, you know, we do the best we can as, as far as that goes. So. One thing I would mention that I didn't state in the memorandum <clears throat> is that um, uh, my street superintendent, Scott Hummel, has is, is put some effort over um, a couple of years ago, um, some effort into shouldering the road. And so we've, we've beefed up the edges of the road, provided us a, a minimal shoulder by backfilling the road with rock um, with the idea of, of providing some safety against runoff road vehicles. Um, and that's something we've been doing um, on an as needed basis throughout Wildwood um, when we have monies available. So that work was done, I would say, and don't quote me on it, I wanna say it was 2017. Um, so there, there could be a little bit of influence going on there in some sections um, because the, the positive is you are you are improving the safety on the road. You're providing a wider template. You're, you're, you're disallowing a car from dropping a tire off the edge of the road, hopefully. But at the same time, you may see the speeds somewhat speed up. Uh, so that, that could well be part of this equation. Um, it's hard to know, frankly, um, with any certainty. Um, but we have, we have made those efforts um, on, on Allenton Road, and we're going to talk about Alt Road um, next. Uh, we've, we've done it on Alt Road as well. Um, so I think that's a positive. And incidentally, the crash history that Captain referenced, um, when you look at the numbers, 2015, 2016, compared to the last three years, it, you know, I, I can't say for sure that there, there's a direct relationship there with the work we did by any stretch, but the crash history does appear to be dropping off a bit. So um, I'd like to think there might be a, a relationship there, but um, certainly can't really uh, confirm that 100%. Um, moving on, if that's okay. Um, but Dave, I think you have a comment. Yeah, uh, Captain Mundell, just, just uh, for your opinion, um, this is a 3.6 mile stretch of road and um, in your opinion, 20 crashes over a five-year period, 170 citations over the last four years, how would you compare that with any other stretch of 3.6 miles within the city? Uh, is this way over the top for that short of a distance or is this about what you'd expect? No, I, I, it's probably below average, honestly. Um, it's just a unique road and, you know, it's not a high traffic volume road, but, you know, it's obviously a kind of a cut through from, from down in the Eureka area, you know, to get up, but not a lot of people know it or use it unless you're kind of going from that area to, to this area. Um, so no, I don't think that the numbers are, are overwhelming. And I, to add what, what uh, Rick was commenting on, when we see, an issue with, with the road, whether it's for a marking or, or signage or something like that, you know, we pass that on to Rick and, and the city is very responsive in, in putting additional markings or signage out, you know, to try and, you know, help the, uh, the traveling people. So um, nothing to group, I guess. Kenny, Kenny, please. Uh, hey, Rick, given the, the 85 percentile is 34 miles per hour, 35, and last year it was 40, or, or, is it is it the posted speed too low? My question. Well, um, you know, that, that's a, that may be a general question for another meeting, possibly, because, you know, we face this we, we face this on other roads. I mean, it's, it's yeah. difficult. You, know, you, you post a speed limit on a 3.6 mile section of road and you expect it to be applicable to that, that 3.6 mile stretch. But the reality is the, the road varies 
constantly. So the ability for people to drive at different speeds varies. People are gonna drive, their tendency is to drive the speed they feel it's safe to drive at. And that's, again, that's where traffic engineers probably try to set the, 80, the speed limit based on the 85th percentile speed. That's where they like it to be. So you can argue that from that perspective, yeah, it probably should be 35 miles an hour. Um, but the only consideration that does come to play with doing that is we had to have to take a very close look at the geometry of the road because if we were to increase it by five miles an hour, which might be more realistic, we would have to look at the curvature mm -hmm. um, carefully so that some of those curves may need to have warnings, speed, speed warnings placed on them. So you may not be able to drive the full segment of the road all 3.6 miles at, at 35. There may be some curves where you'd have to have a warning speed that would be slower um, based on the, the sharpness of the curvature at specific locations. But that, that's routinely what is done on rural roads. Um, if you travel a mowed out road, um, they'll have a posted speed and they will frequently have curves with advisory speeds that are lower than the posted speed. Right, right. Well, I, I was just trying to keep, uh, take Captain Mundell off the hot seat there. I understood. I'll, I'll add what Rick, Rick said, you know, in, in crash investigation, you know, that's one of the things we look at too, that, uh, you know, the engineer designs the road and there's a certain speed that that's how you can, how fast you can go to control your vehicle on a curve or on a hill or something like that. And if, if you go beyond that, you know, if you were to raise it to 40 miles an hour, I'd almost guarantee our, our crash rate is going to, going to, uh, in, in, increase almost immediately because mm -hmm. people think that, well, I can take it a little bit more. If they say the 40 is good to go, I'm going to take it up to 45 and 45 is, you know, way beyond what you should be, you know, traveling at. So right. the, the speed is probably, is probably right, you know, for that okay. road, just because of visibility and the, the width of the road and the curves and all that that's there. So, yeah. Yeah. And certainly that should be considered. And, you know, I know Rick always gets the, uh, the request to lower speed limits. Well, you know, that, that's un unreasonable too, that you, if you make it 20, well at 20, if everyone drives 20, there'll be no accidents. Right. But you're probably not going to have anybody driving 20 because <laughs> they live there and they're familiar with the road and right. they're going to drive with what they're comfortable at, which is, you know, what, what we see as far as statistics. So. Yeah. Okay. So board members, there's a couple comments um, remaining in that memorandum I wanted to mention to you briefly. Um, in discussions that I've had with Captain Mundell, one of the suggestions that we have is to consider the implementation of a permanent LED radar sign or potentially a couple permanent LED radar signs for this section of Allenton Road. Um, we have been using, the, the precinct's been using portable um, battery powered LED radar signs for some time now, um, but the permanent ones are certainly commercially available. They're solar powered um, and, and they're affordable enough that I think it would be something we could easily do in, with our, within our own budget, either through public works or if we wanna go the Prop P route, we could consider that as well. They're about $4,000 to acquire um, and we could have one of our contractors install them. Um, pretty easily. And if we can find a couple locations on, on Allenton where we do have some sunshine, um, I think that would be one idea of uh, making the, uh, the motorist more aware of the speed limit and their speed on this, this area of road. Um, so that was the one, the one suggestion. And if we, if we went this route, um, the thought was if that we were successful with it, we could potentially purchase a few more uh, in, in coming years and, and install those either also on Allenton or other locations. And then at such point where we feel that they're no longer necessary, we think that they're portable enough that we could remove them and then reinstall them elsewhere. So they would be able to be, able to be applied on other roadways potentially in the future. So that's something that I would like to try. And I think Captain's in agreement. Um, it would be nice to have that as a a tool in the toolbox to help address these kind of things on Allenton or other roads in the future. 
And just, just to add to that, uh, the, the temporary ones that we use, we'll put them out for a week to a month somewhere. And it's really just based on, on complaints, uh, you know, citizens request or resident request to, uh, to put them on a particular road, just as a, as an advisory thing to the, to the people traveling that road. Uh, and those are pretty much constantly out. You know, we don't have them sitting on the shelf here. They're, they're out somewhere. Um, and then we move them, you know, to the next place. Uh, they're kind of permanently affixed or, or it's difficult to move them <laughs> as far as someone coming along and you know, just unhooking it from a pole. You know, they're kind of attached more or less permanently to a pole until we, until we move them again. They're, they're locked in place basically. Uh, so Rick and I had talked about, you know, in other places we've seen those permanent signs out there, but at, at some point they, they lose their, uh, their usefulness or they're ignored or, or whatever. So, you know, having the ability to, to use the equipment one place for, you know, six months or a year and then moving it on to someplace else, it's, you know, keeping, keeping it changing, you know, and, and making use of those resources in different places. That, that was going to be one of the items that we were, were going to request was to have some more of those. Just like I said, the, the limited number that we have, I think we have two of them. Those are, those are always uh, requested and they're always uh, out there being moved around. So I think it, I think it'd be uh, useful and probably well received. And the, um, if, there's, if there's no questions on that, the final um, comment about this issue would be to address some, um, we haven't talked so much about the through trucks on the road or truck traffic on the road. If it is a desire of the board to address that, um, the one thing that could be considered um, would be the passage of an ordinance to restrict the road from the through semi-tractor trailers uh, while maintaining an exception for the local and wildwood deliveries. This would be similar to what we've done on Fox Creek, Pond Road and Centaur Road. Um, I don't, based on the counts, we don't have a large issue with tractor trailers on Allenton Road. Um, but I will say you, I have gotten criticism. I've gotten calls from residents who have said, well, you put the restriction on Fox Creek you need to do it on Allenton to be consistent because you're encouraging trucks to utilize Allenton in lieu of Fox Creek Road. Um, I don't know that we've seen that necessarily, um, but I have received that criticism. So by doing a truck restriction, I guess it would take that, that criticism off the table. Um, but again, I don't think we see a huge amount of large tractor trailers um, on the road. And unfortunately, it's kind of difficult right now to get a good handle on traffic counting or trucks, given the situation with the, the pandemic. So with that, if there's any questions, um, be glad to entertain them at this time. Any questions for Rick? I think Rick, we talked about the fact that there would still have to be an allowance for uh, like local deliveries you know, if a box truck or, you know, a small tractor trailer or something like that, which may be what people are seeing right now, that we make this, this or you make this ordinance and we still have to allow the fact that, that people are gonna need stuff delivered. Um, is it really gonna have any kind of an impact? Uh, you know, and I think like you said, we don't see that there's a whole lot of truck traffic going through there to begin with. So, uh, but I understand that the roads are very comparable as far as uh, their structure and restricting one probably warrants restricting the other two. If I might add, um, if there's ever a problem on 109, I would imagine the semi trucks are gonna go up Allenton based on just where their GPS is going to send them if they cannot go up Fox Creek Road. Otherwise they have to go all the way up to Gray Summit. Um, I think that's the next option. They could go through Pacific and Thornton Road. I suppose that's the next one, but um, you know, their GPS is maybe taking them through there when there's a detour. Okay, 
So essentially we have uh, two, two items for the, you know, two questions or, or uh, two suggestions here for uh, the, the issue here. The first would be a recommendation that we put two permanent LED signs uh, on Allenton, or let's, and let's just address these one at a time. So uh, the recommendation um, of, of Rick and the captain, if I'm catching this correctly, is that we uh, purchase and install two LED um, speed, li signs. speed limit signs. Yep. Speed signs for radar. So I would, uh, if someone would just care to put forth that motion by raising their hand or speaking out, okay, there's the motion, any second? Give me a signal, there we go. Um, any discussion? Thank you both for a very thorough recitation. Um, all those in favor, say aye, raise your hand. Aye. aye. Anyone opposed? So, mo so moved and carried, two signs. Um, secondary question is whether we should restrict um, Allenton Road to through trucks, exempting, make a recommendation to the council, obviously, but exempting, you know, deliveries. Having stated that motion, would anyone care to make it? Yeah. So moved. Captain Mundell scratched his ear. I'm going to take that as a motion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Dave. You came in a second. So I'm any discussion of voting. that? I'm a non-voting <laughs> advisor. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, then, <Dave. laughs> I'll, I'll make the first. I'll make the motion. Yeah. Dave moved it and Jeff seconded. All right, there we go. Got to follow, follow Robert's rules. I mean, I'm curious who Robert was, but he said, does have a book of rules. Um, so any any discussion? I'll be honest, I'm kind of ambivalent about this one. Um, I'm not sure it really accomplishes much, but I do understand. You know, when we've when we've done that to one road, it's going to push the traffic. So um, any other commentary or discussion? Yeah, please, Denny. Uh, Captain Mundell, is that having that restriction? Does that create more work for you guys in, in terms of enforcing it? It, it certainly could. Uh, if, if the local delivery, then are we going to make a stop just to ask somebody why they're there? I don't know if, if, if we really can uh, could do <laughs> yeah. that or could do that. Um, you know, it it, it does. It does cause some enforcement uh, issues or concerns. I guess I guess I'm on the, I'm kind of on the fence, and I I hate to, in my opinion, take police resources away from probably more important things to take to deal with a, an issue that I'm not sure is an issue. You know, that's that's kind of why I was asking the question. Uh, and I I appreciate you asking it that way because that's that's really it. We're not gonna post a guy out there to, to watch for trucks. It's, it's kind of a waste of time, honestly. Yeah. Uh, when it, when it, it's really not showing as a, as a major problem. Yeah. Kevin Mundell, is this kind of like the, uh, the jaybreaking issue that we were talking about before that if you had the ordinance uh, and there is an incident in right. which you, you have to respond, you at least have an ordinance in your hip pocket that says to this, maybe the semi just ran off the road or hit somebody, whatever you can, you at least got an ordinance in your pocket that says, hey, you're not supposed to be on this road. Uh, you're not, we don't expect you to send somebody out there every day and monitor it, but right. it is something you have to have in your in your quiver uh, should there be an incident. You're right, you're right. That's certainly uh, applicable there. So the motion on the floor is to um, recommend an ordinance that through truck traffic uh, be restricted and obviously signs put up notifying you know the trucks of same. Um, all those in favor, say aye, raise your hand. Aye. Aye. There we go, all right. Um, I'm going to be the, the voice of contrariness on this one. I'm gonna vote no, but the motion passes. <laughs> So the sign is recommended uh, or the restriction is recommended to council. Okay, we will uh, proceed preparing that ordinance and submit it to the city council then. 
Okay, great. So Alt Road. Moving forward, Alt Road. Um, so board members, um, there's essentially two concerns on Alt Road that I wanted to bring up with you tonight. Um, one of them, the Wallet Precinct has had some direct involvement in. The other one is more of a public works. Um, well, I shouldn't say just public works issue, but um, it had more direct involvement in it. So the first pertains to uh, an issue that was raised um, by Heritage Presbyterian Church relative to truck traffic again on Alt Road. Now, for those of you, hopefully you know, Alt Road again is another north-south route um, that connects to Highway 109 south of Old State Road and it goes south into the city of Eureka, essentially ends at the city limit of Eureka. It, it is a 1.9 mile roadway. It's again, a city maintained road, about 18 feet in width. It's a little bit narrower and it has a, a lower speed limit of 25 miles an hour. And I think I did provide you a traffic count from 2019 mm -hmm. as well. Now the, the situation with the trucks is relative to the Heritage Presbyterian Church, which I, in my memo, I wanted to give you an indication of where that is, but the, the, the church site is right there on the corner of Alt Road and 109. And you can see the church as you drive by on 109, if you look down, down low. So they had made a contact with, with staff regarding an incident more recently this year where a semi-tractor trailer turned off a of 109 onto Alt Road and then proceeded to turn around on their property. Um, apparently the, the semi-tractor, for whatever reason, drove off their parking lot and uh, passed over their septic field and, and caused some damage to their property. So the, the representative with the church was uh, upset with this occurrence and contacted the city and was requesting assistance to eliminate the problem in the future. They indicated that this is not the first time it has occurred um, on their site. So Captain Mundell, I think you made the contact or one of your officers actually made a contact with them um, regarding this concern. Um, I think we have recommended that they install a gate and or signs uh, on their driveway at Alt Road, uh, restricting truck traffic, providing notice that it's private property, that sort of thing. And Captain Mundell, you might want to jump in here. I think they are agreeable to doing that. They were, feel... they were reluctant to put a gate up, uh, being in a, a community uh, location, a church. Uh, they have a playground. You know, they didn't want to uh, dissuade any of their neighbors or, or our parishioners to to come to the property. Uh, so we talked about signage and gave them some examples. And I was down there within the last week or so, and they have not put up any signage either. Um, so it, you know, their their issue is for whatever reason, a truck tractor trailer misses their turn at Fifth Street or whatever down in Eureka and they're looking for a place to turn around, which the high school, they're gonna ride, go right past Eureka High School, which is a perfect location. Um, but they make it all the way up the hill and they kind of look, oh, here's an intersection, there's a parking lot, and they end up in the parking lot before they realize it's a narrow parking lot and it's there's not space for a, a tractor trailer to turn around, which is the, the uh, individual that they, they caught basically. I think the uh, pastor caught the guy uh, figured he'd just drive across their field and then he got stuck and had a tow truck there and was, uh, getting pulled out of the grass when the pastor drove by and inquired what was happening. And, uh, you know, they were certain that had, had they get out, got out of there, they'd have never contacted the church about, about the damage. And there was pretty significant ruts and, and, uh, you know, things that, that the, uh, the church was able to get rectified through the trucking company, you know, after the fact. But, uh, you know, Rick and I have talked about, you know, alternatives, um, you know, would, would MoDOT be willing to put some kind of signage up that, you know, indicates there's a, 
truck turn around ahead and allow them to go up to the next intersection at Old State where they could kind of loop around by LaSalle and then head back south, you know, on 109. Uh, but like I said, they drove right past the high school that has electric signals, has wide driveways. It's, it's a perfect place to turn around a, a, a tractor trailer without really interfering with traffic. Uh, but instead they pick the, the, the narrowest two lane road they, they come to and, and then they're stuck. And, you know, officers have told me that, you know, they've had instances where the, the truck realizes what they're about to do, but they've already committed into the turn. And then they end up trying to back the tractor trailer out onto 109 in, in, in an effort to, to get turned around to go back south and, if they call us, we'll come and help them, but generally they don't call us. So uh, I, I don't know if, if restricting truck traffic is going to do anything. And, and the complaint is really only from that church, as opposed to, unless Rick can comment, if there's been further complaints, you know, further down the road, I, I really don't see, you know, a tractor trailer venturing too far down there. Uh, without realizing pretty quick that they've made a, a very large error. So, um, yeah, I'm certainly not aware of any other <clears throat> specific complaints or requests to restrict the road from like semi tractor trailer traffic. I know we did have an incident. I want to say it was the 2015 flood where a semi tractor went down the road. And I know you, I think the Wildwood precinct responded to assist the driver. So those big over the road tractor trailers really have no business being on that road. Um, from that, so from that perspective, I think it makes some sense to do it. I don't know that it's, it's always questionable how much impact it really does have. But um, if, if we move forward, the thought would be you, you do a similar truck to semi tractor trailer restriction as we we're talking on Allenton road here it would have an exception for um, local wildwood deliveries. It wouldn't apply to local deliveries because they're not considered through trucks. Um, so Hidden Valley does have truck deliveries that would still be allowed. You're just trying to discourage any through large semi-tractor trailers potentially. Um, and Moda did say, I think if we enacted the ordinance, they would consider putting a sign up on Route 109 to notify trucks of that restriction. So that is the expectation if we move forward and got an ordinance passed through city council implementing the restriction, MoDOT would put the sign up on Route 109. Um, so that was really the, the one solution that that we felt was, was something that could be considered was a, a semi-tractor truck restriction for through semi-tractors on, on Alt Road. Um, to help address this situation. Dave? Yeah, I just uh, comment and, and, and question to Rick. Uh, comment is, this sounds to me, Captain, like, and Rick, sounds like a, an exception looking for a rule. Uh, how how many times has this really occurred? Um, is it, you know, I, I empathize with the church that they had damage and so on, but, you know, is that once every 10 years, something like that happens. I, I'm not too empathetic to uh, making any changes there. But the question to Rick is, uh, Rick, I know that this little area, we had some flood mitigation plans in place that would provide another route uh, off of, I think it was off of Alt Road onto, what was it, the, the subdivision, the Radcliffe uh, subdivision or something like that, because that area is subject to flooding down there. Uh, what's the status of that plan and would that provide, if we do that cut through that road, uh, would that provide a semi, a basically a U-turn possibility without going into a church? Um, Council Member Lino, that project um, is underway. I have a consultant working on it. In fact, um, due to get an update from them soon on their design. Um, the main aspect of that project is to elevate Alt Road in this very vicinity. Um, so some of you may be familiar, the road dips below 
um, 109, and when we've had the, the major flooding on the Merrimack, the area right in front of the church floods, and it severs access from Alt Road to 109. So the main aspect of that project is to raise Alt Road up high enough so it does not flood. There's a secondary component that they're looking into, which is the feasibility of providing a, a, a back, a secondary entrance from Alt Road over to Radcliffe Place subdivision. Um, hadn't thought whether it would really provide a U-turn. That's not something we're honestly looking to address with the projects. I don't know that it would provide that opportunity once that project in its, con in its current uh, concept is, is implemented. Um, but it, it, it would eliminate the flooding issue, no doubt. Just to add a wrinkle, uh, the, the lower part of that road, am I, am I thinking the right place, Rick, goes into Eureka? The very so southern that, end of it does enter Eureka, correct, right. So Eureka does have a sign posted limiting uh, <laughs> truck traffic. If you've worked your way all the way down there, there's a sign there. And once you're there, there's nothing you can do. There's no way you're turning a truck around there. So you're going to have to drive into Eureka, uh, violating their, their truck rule. So, it, I mean, if, if we move this forward, it would maybe be consistent with the lower half of the road that's in Eureka. But I, I don't think that this is a highly sought after route for, for truck traffic, honestly. But and I did mention to Rick that the Wildwood roadway was in much better condition than the Eureka roadway. So that's true of a lot of roadways. <laughs> better <laughs> <main road. laughs> I appreciate that. Um, yeah, and I would tend to defer to the Wildwood precinct regarding the need for this ordinance, frankly. Um, it's it's definitely a road that's not suitable for the large trucks, but it, and then again, I don't know that we see them out there either. Okay. Um, so addressing this part again, we've got two issues here. We'll we'll take them one at a time. We haven't gotten to the second one, but we'll get okay. there in a moment. Um, so regarding a re potential restriction on alt road truck traffic, I'm not sensing a great consensus for that, but. If anyone would like to make a motion to so restrict, now is the time. Hearing none, not gonna happen. So next piece. All right, thank you board members. Um, the second um, issue is related to the intersection of 109 and Alt Road, uh, the same vicinity with the church. Um, the department has gotten a request and I believe um, John Bradley, as well with Metro West, got a, 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 an additional request um, regarding the possibility of getting a dusk to dawn streetlight installed at that intersection of Route 109 and Alt Road. Of course, Alt Road is a city street, 109 is a state maintained highway. Um, and the first thought is, will MoDOT do that? It's their road. And the answer is basically in this situation, they will not install lighting at that intersection, but they will not disallow it either. So it kind of falls back to a, a second party to step up um, in this case, if, if a dust to dawn street light is to be installed. Um, there is no lighting at all at the intersection. It is relatively speaking, a fairly heavy road at certain times in the year, particularly when Hidden Valley is operating in the winter time. Um, so I think some lighting at the intersection from a public safety standpoint would certainly be desirable. Um, we did some, some investigation um, with Ameren <clears throat> with regard to a potential installation and Ameren will do that kind of thing um, at request of, of, of an entity such as the city of Wildwood. Um, a lot of times these are addressed by an HOA or if it's a private street, they will typically take it on themselves to do this kind of thing. But since Alt is a city street and there is no logical entity other than the city, uh, it would seem that it would fall back to uh, Wildwood to do this if we move forward. Ameren quoted me what I felt were some very reasonable costs to install a light, and it would be on a wooden pole um, connected to a power source nearby. And 
the, the figures that I were getting, that I was receiving uh, over the phone talking to Amron's representative was about $2,000 to install. Um, and then they require a three-year agreement um, in addition. And the, but the monthly cost of the three-year agreement is only $16 a month. So um, I'm thinking that's a really good value, frankly. Um, and they handle all the installation. We just have to get an agreement approved and through city council, and then we pay the monthly bill. I would say that if we move forward in this situation, <clears throat> it is a little bit precedent setting because we, to my knowledge, don't have any other lights that we maintain or, or are responsible for outside of the town center. We do maintain street lights in the town center area um, all new subdivisions that are in, that are constructed, the street lights are taken over by the city, um, except if there's alleys that are privately maintained. But but we do this sort of thing in town center, but we really haven't taken it on outside of town center. So um, it would be a precedent from that standpoint. Um, but given the cost and the potential benefit, I, I think it's probably a, a good uh, a good thing. So that's really the uh, the recommendation here would be to to move forward with that agreement with Amron um, to install the dust of dawn light. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to address them at this time. And Danny? Uh, I, and I haven't had a chance to look at the, uh, the crash reports, but was, were there any crashes at that intersection? Just out of curiosity. Well, Danny, that's a good question. and. Um, if you'd like, we can provide that to you, um, but I don't have that information in front of me. So yeah, I, well, I don't, I don't either right now, or else I'd look it up myself. Um, uh, not, so not that that should be the reason why we do or we don't. I was well, just curious. I think that's a good question. I probably should have looked into that and provided it to you. Yeah. Um, so if, if the board would like us to bring that back to you the next meeting, we'd be glad to do that. Okay. Let me see if uh, Brad can look at that right now. He's he's here yeah. in the building. So. <laughs> You know, and, and, and I think if that section of 109, you drive that at nighttime between Old State and Eureka High School, uh, it's pretty dark. I mean, it, it, you, you have this feeling you're out on a country road, and I guess you are. Uh, so I'm not, I'm by, no, by asking the question, by no means am I uh, opposed to, you know, the proposal. Yeah. Good question. Dave? Yeah, I, having driven that, uh, as all of us have, and I've taken my grandkids out to uh, Hidden Valley at times. Uh, that is a that's a tough intersection. I, I think this light would be a good idea. Uh, I would caution, I guess, Rick. We probably uh, we say it's a dark country rail, but that's kind of wildwood. You know, that's the light pollution is a big deal for the for the city, and. Uh, I don't know if there's any immediate residents that would be impacted by it. Um, I think Radcliffe is the closest. I don't think there's anything on the east side of uh, that intersection in terms of housing. But Rick, we might just make a mental note that probably the reps from the council members from Ward 6 ought to be made aware and said uh, if they want to reach out to uh, for comments from the Radcliffe HOA, because we've had some real issues with them as you probably know, when uh, over the last couple of years, when uh, Hidden Valley was trying to implement their um, mm -hmm. zip line, yep. and we went through meeting after meeting, you know, discussion, discussion. So they're kind of sensitive. They, the HOA and Radley were pretty sensitive to um, things that impact. They think they're now that's not in their subdivision, but it's right close to their to their entrance. So I just, word of caution, Rick, I think we need to reach out to them just to make sure that there's no, um, you know, the light goes up and all of a sudden we've got people at our front door with a pitchfork saying, uh, uh, burn, you know, burn it down. Kind of um, yeah, it's a point well taken. I can, I would offer to the board, if you like, I can try to, to provide that um, in advance of making a formal decision on it if you prefer. I would just I'd make the motion that we that we uh, proceed with this uh, with this light and uh, get the ball rolling and if Rick comes up with a 
any kind of obstacles we can always get around. There's more of a courtesy thing that I was talking about. I don't think they can stop it. And okay. I think it's a good idea safety wise, but just to, just as a courtesy, I think we want to uh, reach out to them. So I'd make the motion that we go ahead and uh, allocate the funds and uh, have the installation occur. Do I hear a second? There it is. So uh, ex excellent points, everybody. I think it would be good to uh, uh, you know make the neighbors know. Jim. Uh, so it is in the it is in the crash report. Uh, on page nine, I believe, um, for 109 and alt, it, it was on a downward trend until last year where it spiked. Uh, so it was going down in 2018, there were two accidents, 2019, there were seven. However, uh, Brad just checked this year, there's been none up to this point. So, so 19 may have just been odd for one reason or another, but uh, there are crashes at that location. I can't tell right offhand if they're, they're injury crashes or not, but uh, they are happening there. It, it is an odd, an odd intersection, and like anywhere, if you wait until everybody goes by, you're probably just fine. But if, if you take a chance, you might get hit. So, uh, so certainly a light, a light there would, would not be uh, you know, out of line. Okay, Denny. We just um, just justified the light. <laughs> so when the next guy comes in and wants the light, at least we got a basis. We've had well, we've had seven crashes there in 2019. <laughs> it, it, Captain Mundell, do, can, does your record show whether those are daytime or nighttime accidents? Uh, the re the report does not. So we'd have to look at each of those crashes. Um, you know, it takes a few minutes. Yeah take a few minutes to do that but that's all right it just it, obviously if they're all daylight crashes then our lights yeah. Move yeah, right. but, <laughs> so you gotta assume that there's a mixture there yeah. we'll, we'll look now that you brought it up <laughs> <laughs> it is an interesting question okay so the motion on the floor is to uh, recommend the addition of that light uh, with the caveat that the uh, ward six representatives will uh, you know seek comment from the from the neighbors if you will so all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No opposed, motion passes. Thank you. And lastly, Windsor Crest Boulevard. Um, thank you, Marshall. Board members, this last item was at least brought to my attention through the Wildwood Precinct. Um, so I'll certainly defer to the captain on this one regarding the specifics, but I guess in general, I'll kind of set the information out there. And on the 24th of July, from my understanding, there was a call placed um, to a residence in Windsor Crest or uh, Windsor Manor subdivision on Windsor Crest Boulevard. Now that's the subdivision that's located at Highway 100 and 109. It's on the northwest corner, essentially, of that intersection. Um, so when the response was made to that call, apparently there was an issue with Metro West getting their fire, their ladder truck to the address. Um, and the issue had to do with on-street parking and parked vehicles um, conflicting with the Metro West truck. So they were unable to get through in their initial path and they had to divert and reroute. Um, they were able to get to the house simply by rerouting on the other leg of, of Windsor Crest Boulevard. So I don't know there was a significant concern ultimately with the response, but it certainly does raise the question of, is there something that needs to be done relative to parking restrictions um, to avoid the situation in the future? Um, I, I will make a couple comments about the subdivision streets in that subdivision are 26 foot wide, which is it as a general rule is a st standard residential width in the city of Wildwood and, and also throughout St. Louis County. Now we have some roads that are wider, but that's the general subdivision street width from um, from face of curb to face of curb in this case. Um, so. The, the subdivision from that perspective is very typical of most 
small lot subdivisions in the city of Wildwood. Those streets are not more narrow, they're, they're normal width. Um, and we certainly do not have any specific parking restrictions in place right now in that subdivision, nor do we restrict parking on 26 foot wide residential subdivision streets currently in the city of Wildwood. Um, Captain, do you wanna add more specifics relative to the incident? And I know that you've made a comment, a contact already with the HOA about this issue? Yes, so the, uh, it, it was a, a medical a medical call, so they're sending a, and I, the, the chief's not here with us now, so I can bash the fire department, not really. Uh, You're being recorded, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it, it's a, a, medical, a medical call, so there's an ambulance and a fire truck uh, sent to that, and the fire truck happens to be the ladder truck, which is the biggest truck they got. Um, I don't, I don't believe there's any issue with that ladder truck being capable of driving down a straight, a straight street with cars parked on both sides. There's generally going to be, you know, 15 to 16 feet of space for that that fire truck to get down there. Their issue was making the turn at the at the intersection because there were vehicles parked very close to the intersection on both sides. So they, they couldn't maneuver right to, to thread the needle there basically. Um, and then like Rick said, they were, the ambulance was a, able to basically go around the block. It's not a huge subdivision. Um, and then when our, our officer was there, he, he knocked on some doors and got, got things moved before they were ready to leave. So uh, we didn't talk to the HOA, um, their, their president, was basically, you know, ready to to ask for, you know, no parking on one side of the street. I I think that's almost overkill, and and it really inconveniences <laughs> a lot of people that you can't park, you know, in front of your own house or you're required. And everybody has driveways and garages. Uh, in, in this particular area, they have an alleyway behind their houses. And then they have street parking in front of the house. So their garages are on the back side, of, if I'm thinking right. Is that right, Rick? That's correct, right. Their, their garages are on the back side of the residence off an alleyway. Um, so basically, one, one half of the subdivision is probably not going to be too happy with the fact that they can't park in front of their own house and will probably ir aggravate their neighbor across the street when they park in front of theirs. So I, I think we should probably really just look at at those intersections uh, you know should they be posted you know if that requires us to ask the fire department to to bring a truck in there and what works best I'd rather uh, you know we restrict parking near the intersections so that they can make the turn because I think that's a legitimate concern that if there's a house fire that could happen or 4th of July or any time of year uh, that they'd be able to get down, get down the street with, with all their trucks, all their equipment, you know, be able to get onto a scene. So, um, you know, that, that would be my recommendation. I, I think they're, they're open to, to that. Uh, the response I think was, was a little bit, you know, extreme as far as, you know, forbidding parking on one side of the street, you know, through the whole, through the whole subdivision. I, I think they'd get a lot of pushback from their own residents on, on doing that. And, and I don't really don't believe it's, that's a necessity at this point. Anything else? Rick? So, so basically, I, th I think the message, um, based on this incident, as if it's fair to say that we're going to try to work with the HOA to, to further develop some parking restrictions. And once we decide on what they would be, we'll, we'll certainly bring them back to the board Thanks. Um, before they would go to the city council. Rick, is there a requirement there? Does that fall under your, your authority to restrict some, some parking with what's with ordinances that are already in place. 
Um, I'd have to check. There are some areas that they'll allow some discretion through the through the department to enact signs that would restrict parking. Um, I don't know that it would apply to here. Um, and frankly, in a lot of a lot of cases, it's almost better to take it through. Um, the Board of Public Safety and the City Council just to make sure that people are aware of what we're doing and have a chance to comment on it, if it if it's at all controversial or sensitive. Um, we, we can certainly double check that. Um, and if I feel that it is something we have the discretion to do, I don't mind bringing it back to the board and providing notice of it as well, um, just so there's knowledge of where we're proceeding with this issue. Uh, so it's an important issue. Okay, we'll, we'll meet with them again and kind of just discuss what, what options, uh, you know, would work best for them without, you know, causing a huge pan, uh, impact on the whole subdivision. Yes, and I, and I would agree that implementing a, a subdivision-wide restriction is probably easier said than done. Um, I think once residents really recognize that you know what they're faced with i think i think a lot of them will not be in favor of it um ultimately and that's just why we don't have we just don't frankly have it anywhere else um to my knowledge at least not not in the older subdivisions uh you know it it's just not it's just not usually popular with overall with the, with the residents any uh, question or comment Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, this is another one of those precedent setting issues that we got to handle carefully because it's, it's uh, as Rick was saying, I mean, we have miles and miles of 26 foot wide residential streets and you can't treat one differently than another, you know, in, in some of these circumstances. So, yeah, we've got to come up with a good solution. Okay. So it's, it sounds like you guys are going to continue to meet with the HOA and uh, see what kind of progress can be made that way. I think that's a fair assessment, Mr. Okay. Marshall. No, sounds like a good plan. Any objection? I didn't think so. I know because it's almost 830. So, so uh, I think that was the last real action. Of Dave? If I, if I may, uh, Scott, um... This is not an agenda item, but it was uh, something that was communicated to me and I want to pass along to the committee uh, and maybe put it on our next agenda. Uh, that is my cohort here in Ward 5, uh, Council Member McCutcheon, contacted me and asked if we could look into uh, speeding on Fullerton Meadow Drive. That's in Ward 5 um, and Fullerton Meadow is only about well, maybe uh, quarter of a mile long between uh, Forest Leaf Parkway, which is a main through street and uh, Westland Farms, which is another through street. Uh, so that's going from you know, east to west. And uh, the request was Captain Mundell, uh, could we do a speed survey um, on that? And as you probably know, there's a significant hill there that goes down into Cox Creek and comes back up. And uh, some of the neighbors have been complaining. So uh, I have two things, Scott, could we put this on the agenda for next month and in the interim, maybe ask uh, if Captain Mandel can have a speed survey done in that section of road. Absolutely. Matter of fact, we just did it. <laughs> oh. I think it's all been done. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. And, and a lot of the, I think you hit it right there. The, uh, the hill has, has something to do with, with speeds you know, that, that people aren't guarding their speed when they're, they're going down the hill. Yeah. Um, I don't remember what the numbers are. I, I just forwarded that at the end of the day to Rick. Okay. Um, I have not looked at it yet either, frankly. I saw you, you jumped right on it and got it done, but it, it'll be on the agenda for the next meeting. Thank yeah, you. I, she, Thank I think, you. asked at the right time last week, because normally we do those surveys uh, like midweek mid to midweek. So it just ended uh, today. You know, it started last week right after she asked. So it was very timely to, that we were able to, to get right on it. Um, the, uh, the accidents, uh, Brad worked very fast. And in 2018, the accidents at 109 and Alt, there were only two of them. And they were both at night in darkness. Good. In 2019, there was, I think I said seven. Those were all 
basically afternoon, uh, not even twilight. I think six six p.m. was probably the latest one there. So it's <laughs> it's kind of a weird anomaly there that more accident happened during the daylight as opposed to at night. But I still think it's a good move to put a light there. So. But it is dark at that time of day in the winter. So were any of those in the winter? Uh, let me look real quick. So the 2018, one was in March, one was in June. Uh, the June one involved in an animal. So I guess somebody hit a deer there, the road was dry. The one in March, the road was wet. So that most likely raining, that was at about 8 p.m. And the 2019, uh, one was in February. Uh, the road's dry. September, the road's dry. Well, basically all of them in, in 19, the roadway was dry. So uh, two of them were in December, one was in November, one October, two September, one in February. So yeah. weather doesn't appear to be, be an issue there. Three of them involved uh, animals. So in 2019, three of them were probably deer struck um, one of them was a rollover, so that person, you know, speculating may have fallen asleep or something like that, that they ran off the road, so. So, yeah, that's all I got. Okay. Good stuff. So, uh, I don't see any other items on the agenda. I don't think we had anyone dial in, so... Um, at this time, being that it's almost 8.30, would accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right, that was quick. Here we go. <laughs> all, all those in favor, say, see you next time. See you next time. Hey. hey. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it very much. Good night.